Okay. Our guest tonight is one that's going to give you some surprises because uh, he was born and raised in Belfast, but his experiences don't fit neatly into what you might expect. And as the evening goes along, you'll see maybe that some of the things he has to say uh, are unexpected as far as your background in this course. Uh, this is Mr. Chris Robinson, who uh, took this course what, four years ago, five yeah, years ago, something was, like mm -hmm. that? It almost wasn't fair because he was the only person in the class born and raised in Belfast. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we had a simulation. And uh, Chris played the part of... Sammy Wilson. Sammy Wilson, okay. And uh, Sammy is uh, one of these uh, people who speaks more than uh, maybe he should from time to time. Uh -huh. um, but at any rate, uh, Chris was born in Belfast. Um, Grew, was born in an area called Old Park, which is North Belfast, a small neighborhood that's very close to Catholic neighborhoods on both sides, really. And three sides. Actually. Three sides, yeah. okay. Because you had Cliftonville on the east side. That's right. Um, to south of that was uh, the New Lodge. That's right. And then just north of that was Ardoin. That's right. And to the west was the Shankle Road. So. And all three of these uh, all of those neighborhoods, Protestant and Catholic, would be working class neighborhoods. This is not the leafy suburbs of Belfast. These are people who, are, who have the highest unemployment rate, who have the lowest level of going on to uh, element or to secondary schools and colleges and universities. And it also accounts for a great percentage of those people who did the fighting and the dying in, in uh, Northern Ireland. So, Chris, born in Belfast, uh, moved out of Belfast at age 10. Uh, yeah, about 9 or 10. Went on to a place called Monkstown, which is uh, northeast of, uh, no, north, northwest of Belfast, actually. Mm -hmm. Then came back to an area called Valley Duff, which is north Belfast, mm -hmm. or north of Belfast. North Belfast. Um, then moved to, to London, and then I think it, the prime age of about 27 or so moved to the United States, mm -hmm. where he lives uh, out in Newburgh and is in, very much involved in, in wineries and things of that nature. So I'm going to give Chris a chance to go off topic if he wants to any time. But let me just start by asking you, Chris, about the neighborhood you grew up in. What was it like? What kinds of... Uh, of expectations did people have of young people growing up in, uh, in Old Park? Well, um, I was born in 64, and uh, the trouble started in 69. And like Bill says, we, I was living in the Old Park neighborhood, which was surrounded on three sides by Catholic areas. Um, and I had a sense that um, there was something going on, but I didn't really know what it was. Um, people were acting different um, after 69. Uh, people were more cautious. Um, there was curfews at night. There was a lot of soldiers on the streets. Um, so it was, it was a, a big change. Um, I, um, I didn't realize till later on um, the full extent of what, what was happening. Um, it was kind of fun at the time, you know, it was kind of like a, some kind of game. Um, yeah, me and my friends would try to sneak out at night and, you know, hide from the soldiers and, and stuff like that. Um, did you but expect I think that soldiers were on the streets of other towns around or did you know that you were different because you were in Belfast? <coughs> I mean, other towns I outside we, of... Yeah, I thought we were different because, you know, later on I, got, I, I realized that these neighborhoods had to be separated. Um, so I thought, you know, they're there to protect us and, and to protect the other community. Um, they were the dividing wall. Um, but it, it, things got really bad and... Um, you know, at the age of about nine, so the early 70s, my parents pretty much said they'd had enough and they wanted to get out of that neighborhood. Um, it was dangerous going to school. My school 
uh, primary school, which is like an elementary school, was in a Catholic uh, neighborhood. And uh, I remember one day uh, missing the bus, so I had to walk to school. And uh, it was in the Ardoyne, uh, uh, which is a hardcore um, Republican neighborhood. And I was probably about six or seven at the time. And, and uh, Did you was, know you were in danger? Yeah, I mean, I see these group of kids coming around from the other side of the street and they had hurley sticks you know if you've ever seen a hurley stick it's kind of a like a hockey stick like a ho short hockey stick and it's made of like ash wood which is really hard wood and they started chasing me and I remember for all I was worth <laughs> um, and yeah I mean I, I remember our school getting hit by um, an RPG which is a rocket propelled grenade this was a primary school the primary school had a, uh, a watchtower in it that the soldiers used so they could look over West Belfast and the Ardorn area, the Republican area. And they didn't think that um, the IRA would, uh, you know, attack uh, primary school. But uh, they did fire a rocket at the, at the lookout post. It didn't explode. It just, like, took a chunk out of the, the tower. Mm. Um, and we thought that was great because, you know, we got the ride down in the Saracens that day, you know. These are big, like, personnel carriers that the soldiers use. So all the kids were just pushed in the back of those and taken back down to the old park. You mentioned your parents. What were your parents like? They, your father was English. Your mother was Northern Irish. They yes. were both working class, were they? Both working class. My, uh, my dad was a, a, a lorry driver, a, a truck driver. And... Um, my mom worked in a mill. Um, she a linen mill was it? Yeah, a linen mill. Okay. Um, and she she grew up in a mixed neighborhood. Um, it was probably more Catholic. It was probably seventy thirty. And this was a place called Balmore off the Shore Road. Mm. Um, so her views growing up um, were a lot different from. Um, many uh, Protestant families, uh, Protestant women's views. Um, she had a lot of Catholic friends growing up. Um, and I remember going down to see my grand grandmother. She lived in a, a Catholic neighborhood. And, uh, you know, it, there was never any problem. But after 69, um, they had to get out of there. What neighborhood did she live in? I'm just curious because... That was, uh, that was Balmore, and she lived okay. in a place, uh, Dandy Street. It's just off the Shore Road. Okay. Um, okay. Kind of just before Whitewell. All right. Um, All these are small neighborhoods. Real, real small. And the right. small ones are the most dangerous because people can move in and out quickly. And the large ones actually give you some security yeah. because they have got to go through quite a few areas before they can get yeah. to you. And you're only talking about a, a number of streets, six, seven streets. Mm -hmm. That would define a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and she was sad to go um, because she did have a, uh, you know, she grew up with these people. And in the early 70s, uh, my grandmother, I mean, she had, she had nine kids. She had five boys. And um, yeah, all my uncles were, you know, in their late teens or early twenties, and it, it was a dangerous time for, for young men like that. They had to get out of there. How about the other students in your elementary school, in your secondary school, especially in Belfast? What kind of people were they? You, you, you had some a rather lot of those guys. They were tough guys. <laughs> yeah, a lot of those guys um, went on to be, um, you know, pretty high up men in, in these paramilitary organizations. I mean. I knew a lot of those guys, I mean, guys that have become notorious, like the Lenny Murphy. Yeah, let me just mention a couple. He mentioned Lenny Murphy, who went on to become the leader of the Shankill Butchers, who, uh, who had a reputation for, for killing Catholics, um, torturing them before they were killed. Um, and he, I think it was the longest crime wave in British history. Uh, in terms and of... the biggest mass murderer. Yeah, the biggest mass murderer in British history. So that was one of the guys in your neighborhood. Another guy was Johnny Adair, uh, who bragged that he killed 30 Catholics on his own, and 
and he then, you know, reaction against him caused the Shanko bomb, and then the Gray Steel killings that came after that. Um, and another one was John, was, uh, John Gregg, uh, who also attempted to kill Jerry Adams, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So these are the kinds of guys we're talking about. Um, tough people. Yeah, yeah, tough guys. Um, so what were the other students? I mean, these are three of the worst, but... Uh, um, I don't Would there be a lot of, of exclusive feeling that us against them? Yeah, it totally was like that, um, even from a very early age. Uh, you, you never questioned it, you know, if you were from that neighborhood, if you were from the old park or you were from the Shango, um, the, you know, these were your beliefs and they were Protestant beliefs and loyalist beliefs and y you never questioned that. Um, you might have thought different, but you would never say anything different. Um, and yes, I mean, they, they, they all stuck together, they all socialized together, um, everything revolved around um, them and us. Okay. Um, and Any uh, contact with Catholics at all in your first, say, 10, 12, 15 years? Yeah, they tried to introduce this cross-community. Um, Thing where they they take kids from the bad neighborhoods, like there was a group from our dorm and there was a group from the old park from our school, and they took us away to Liverpool, mm. and uh, you know we spent a you know I think it was a week or something, um, but it was really funny because nobody <laughs> interacted with anybody from the other side. Just kind of just kind. Of, I mean, we, we we stayed with these families, and uh, and it was one of those things where let's take these kids out of the troubles and just show them some normality. Um, and then they would they brought us all together to this big theme park thing, and everybody split into their respective tribes, and uh, that was uh, <laughs> and that was interesting because you know um, I think what the Bill Shaw's doing is great. I mean, I just, I know that's been tried in the past, and, and, um... Bill Shaw is the one I made reference to earlier, who was a Presbyterian minister, and he, he really made a career out of bringing people together, but you're, you're suggesting maybe that isn't so easy to do? Well, you know, this stuff runs deep, and I think, you know, seven or eight hundred years of of injustice and, and, and subjugation and all that it can't be washed away in a few decades. I mean, there are great attentions, you know, and I, I just, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel that um, we've kind of come full circle, especially with the, uh, you know, the political situation now where you have the two extreme parties mm -hmm. in power. Mm -hmm. Um, I really don't see how that's going to work. I mean, they're already at each other's throat. They're already making these deals. Um, you ha you st the, the Republicans are no further on than, than they were 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, no matter how they painted up, you know, Mark McGinnis is, you know, still deputy first minister, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's... You know, I don't think it's changed that much. And I think when, when um, the SDLP and the UUP um, kind of get swept aside, uh, I think that was a real missed opportunity. Um, and, it, you know, it's going to take a long, long time. You know, a couple of things. You talked about the UUP and the SDLP being swept aside, the moderate parties. Why? Well, I think it's it's a fear thing. They play into people's fears, deep-rooted fears, and the DUP goes, oh, "You can't vote for the UUP. They're just going to give everything away. They're just going, to, you know, concessions here, left, right, and center." Um, and then on the other side, Sinn Féin's going, "Man, you know, they're going to vote the DUP." I mean. SDLP, I mean, they're just, they're moderates, they're going to cave in. I mean, we're, we're going to stand up for, for the, the nationalist side, the Republican side. And so you get the people just going apart again. And, you know, um, and, and they know, they know how to push those buttons. 
talking about the parties being people separating to the extremes. This last week there was an article about Queen's University and they pointed up that the leading parties for Catholics was Sinn Féin and the leading party for Protestants was the DUP. So to a great extent, young people, your ages, would be representative of the larger sample. So we're talking about not a generational thing, but a general thing where people stick with their group and don't depart from it, even though they might be you know, 16, 18 years old. Uh, they still stay. So it's not an old people's conflict, it's a new people's, young people's conflict as well. Yeah, and that's something I noticed. I was reading some articles the other day there. And, uh, you know, they had arrested some guy for some dissident thing. And he was 30 years old. I thought, you know, what chance? Yeah, yeah. You got? Because they're already getting involved in that. And I think my generation, you, you know, if anything is going to happen, they need to get out of the way. Because we grew up right from the get-go in that. And there's a lot of people passing on that, that anger and that hatred. And that's why you get these young. I mean, there's, there's also social economic problems there, too. And that feeds into it as well. You left, though. I did. Why did you leave? You were how old when you left and went to London? I was 19. 19, and you did this on your own. You didn't do this because your family was moving. You went on your own. Well, I knew, I mean, like we said earlier, I knew all these guys. I mean, that's why nothing ever happened to my family. And, um, you know, I was able to move around. But I knew that there would be a point where they would say to me, hey, you know, the famous thing is there's a war going on here, mm. you know, mm. you know, you need to stand up or you need to do something about this because you can only live on the periphery for so long. I mean, I was surprised I got away with it as long as I did. Um, I mean, I had friends that were all involved, but we, nobody said. Would it have been easy for you to get in? Yeah. I mean, there's no, no selective process. I mean, just, no, I. You know, I if you have a question, why don't you go over to the mic? Uh, I'm pretty loud, if that's okay. Sorry, do you want me to talk on the mic? What would be best? Going to the mic? Go to the mic, yeah. We'll, we'll, we're talking about how easy it is to get in or whether you're drawn in. And you have a question. I was just going to ask if it's kind of like, uh, like gangs are here in the States, where if you're a certain age, you're just kind of expected to be part. And that's why you went to London? To get away from yeah, that. it's similar to that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on you. Um, and, you know, you're living in that neighborhood and you're surrounded by that, and it's very, very hard to stay on the outside of that. Um, and Chris's neighborhood, correct me if I'm wrong, were mostly UDA rather than UVF. Yeah. And we're talking two paramilitary groups. The difference between them would be what? UDA well, is larger, first of all. UDA is larger, and they had some, I mean, they've had this quasi kind of legal status. I mean, I, they didn't, they weren't outlawed until 92, I think it was, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and I remember growing up, they would patrol the neighborhood as well, and, you know, soldiers would tolerate them, and the police would tolerate them. I mean, because, you know, the police was 95% Protestant, so, I mean, if they're doing the job for the police, then more par to them, but um, they were always a joke because they were like kind of the official IRA, the, the stick man that, you know, would go around and, 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 you know, patrol the neighborhood with, you know, night sticks or whatever and, you know, enforced curfews where like the UVF or the provisional IRA or INLA or some group like that went out and actually did, um, you know, the fighting or the, you know, the bombing or whatever it might be. So were the, the UDA, were they a bit more macho? Or no. Or would you not say that? No. We, no, they were, they were, they were kind of light. Um, and there was more of them, but um, they were, they were, 
more out there. Um, and they, they weren't really the ones that um, did any of the, the, the fighting. Why two groups? You know, we're talking about Protestant paramilitary groups, the Ulster Defense Association, the UDA, and the UVF, which would be the Ulster Volunteer Force. And the Ulster Volunteer Force was 1913, whereas the UDA got started in about mm -hmm. 1971 or two, somewhere right. there. Why two different groups? Well, I think it's, it's kind of like an army thing. You know, you have your regular army, and then you have your, your specialists. You know, you, you have your, you know, your Marines or your Navy SEALs or whatever it is. And I think that's why. I mean, you had these guys that wanted to go out and do something about it, or you had the UDA that just wanted to contain and protect the area that they had. But these other groups, like the ones you mentioned, Paul, like the UVF, the UFF, they wanted to go into the other neighborhoods and take the fight okay. to, the, to the Catholic okay. side. Okay. And, and, and the response from the other side was, that, was to have similar groups, like the, the, uh, you know, the Provisionals uh, and uh, INLA. And, uh, groups like INLA that. is an Irish National Liberation Army, who, who on the Republican side would be more inclined towards gangsterism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, on the Protestant side, the UVF considers themselves to be a little bit above the UDA. Mm -hmm. They kind of regarded themselves as being, um, you know, they have a richer history, they go back, and they kind of regarded themselves as being more disciplined. Would you have picked that up when you were growing yeah, up? Yeah, I mean, they, they had a history to them. They had, you know, fought in battles, a battle of the Somme and mm -hmm, stuff like that mm -hmm. in the First World War and, and uh, you know, had, were highly decorated. These were, you know, volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they definitely did have that. And, and kids like me knew that. I mean, you know, we were taught this stuff going up, so it was like, oh, he's in the UVF, well, you know, that's, you know, you got to give that guy respect and mm -hmm. whatever. Um, whereas, the, you know, the UDA were just, you know. Guys off the street. Guys off the street, exactly. Okay. Were you aware when you were growing up that the IRA was more selective in who they took in, whereas the Protestant paramilitaries <laughs> weren't that selective, right? Yes. I always, did, did, <laughs> actually, I always had a lot of respect for the, for the IRA. Um, even when you were young? Yeah, I mean, they, you know, the ideology behind that, I mean, I, you know, my thoughts when I got older, I mean, definitely ventured towards more, you know, social leanings. Um, that's why I, you know, I like John Hume, I like the SDLP, I never would say anything like that. Um, but I respected the IRA for, for, for standing up you know, to the British Empire, mm. and, you mm. know, this, this was a small group. You wouldn't have dared say that in your neighborhood? No, no, and I, I probably won't even, I wouldn't say it to Today. certain people, no. Oh. Um, so, but, um, yeah, I mean, they had a cause, they had a, they had a fight that, w that was, um, you know, justifiable, I mean, they, they definitely did. Um, but I, you know, I don't agree with a lot of their tactics okay. and the way they want to fight things. Okay. I have a question for the floor. Uh, yes. Uh, were you able to discuss these views that you've just been talking about in your home? And how did your parents feel? Did they agree? Or did, did they never speak about how they thought? Question. That is a good question. Yeah. No, I, uh, no, I never expressed you know, any, any of those feelings towards my family or friends. Um, I, I never did, even when I was, you know, I've been going almost 25, 26 years now. Um, my mom, like, you know, like I said earlier, she grew up in a, in a mixed neighborhood. Um, so she, she had some sympathy for, for the nationalist community. Mm. My dad was a, a, an ex-soldier, British soldier, um, so he didn't respect anybody from the North, okay. Protestant or Catholic. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we would put the flag out, uh, you the know. Union in, in the Union Jack? The Union Jack, and 
on July, you know, um, and that was something my dad would do, my mom, you know. You know, she, she didn't bother with that, but, I mean, they would walk around the neighborhood and see who had a flag up and who didn't. I mean, it was so extreme. Um, yeah, you know, we, we celebrated all the, you know, the, the loyalist holidays and, and, you know, you know, the walk, went out and watched the bonds and watched the bonfires on the 11th night and, and stuff like that. But, you know, the thing is, you can't really stand up to that. I mean, you're, t I mean, I remember f going to, you know, one of these clubs and they used to run the bars and the gambling and all that, you know, that's how they got a lot of their money. Um, so you go to these clubs and they, each paramilitary group had their own clubs. And we used to go to the Loyalist Club in the Shackle, you probably know that one. So. And at the end of the night they would play God Save the Queen. So everybody has to stand up. No matter how drunk you are, you got to get up. <laughs> and if you didn't get up, they would take you outside and give you a beating. Now, I remember living in London. I lived in London for seven years. And not once did they play God Save the Queen in any bar I was in in London at the point. end of the night. Interesting. And they have not, a lot of these guys haven't got a clue. I mean, they, they you know, they pledge allegiance to the, you know, the Union Jack and God Save the Queen and all. And it's like, go over there and live there and see how they treat you. I lived in London for seven years, and, and uh, it doesn't matter if you were Catholic or Protestant. You know, if you were from Northern Ireland, they just didn't want to know you. You just did what? They just didn't want to know you. Okay. Uh, they treated you all the same. All the same. And that, that's what, you know, and these guys over there, you know, these diehards, and, you know, that are up waving their flags and singing God to you. Queen and what have you, I haven't got a clue, you know. That was, uh, that was a big eye opener for me. You mentioned playing God Save the Queen. I wonder if you had this experience. I don't think you and I have ever talked about this, but uh, at the end of movies, um, you know, regular movies and movie theaters, they would play God Save the Queen at the very end and everyone had to stand up. And nationalists knew this as well as, as, as loyalists. So nationalists would always sit at the end of the aisle so they could get up and leave rather than stand up. And then if they were a couple of seats in, they'd try to leave, but the loyalists would not let them leave because they wanted to make them stand up. And it was a, did you experience this as a kid going no, to movies? No, that's, no. Okay, yeah. okay. Maybe this was from the but nationalist that, point of view that they yeah. were really, some of them said, I never saw the end of a movie because I always left, you know, five minutes. Of, you know, the best part of the movie, they walked out so they didn't have to stand up. And that probably happened in Belfast because yeah. you have that, like, that's the other thing. I mean, we want the, the movie theaters in our neighborhoods yeah. are close to our Protestant neighborhoods right. that were close right. to us. It was Belfast. We, it was kind of one of those areas where you didn't know. So it's best not to, you know. Mm. Especially during those times. You know. Stay, stay in your own neighborhood. Stay in your own neighborhood, um, and that didn't change for a long, long time. Still hasn't really changed. Yeah. Not really. I mean, there are neighborhoods that that you would go into, and you'd say, "What's dangerous about this?" Shatsbury Square, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, the university students are all over the place. Except you got, you got. Let's see, two neighborhoods. You got uh, the Loyalist uh, Sandy Row. Sandy Row on one side, and and what's the one on the other side? Sandy uh, Row. Uh, no, we can't. You don't want to. But it's it's also it's also a Loyalist neighborhood. Uh, but I'm told that now they're integrating Catholics into the police force, so they're putting them into these neighborhoods. You know, Catholic Donegal police officers. Pass, yeah, is it Donegal Pass. Donegal Pass. Donegal so you got Donegal Pass on one side, Sandy Row on the other, and Shatsbury Square right in the middle that looks for all appearances as being safe and a lot of little clubs and drinking places and, you know, students going in and having a couple of pints. 
except that you, if you came out and didn't know the neighborhood, you could take a wrong turn and end up in a part of town where you get beat up. Mm -hmm. You didn't have the right accent, didn't know the right songs, didn't uh, have the right connections. Yeah, that's funny you should mention that because that's what a lot of Protestants had to learn um, the Hill Mirror. Ah. And a lot of Catholics learned um, massage. Yeah. So if they were ever caught, and they'd ask them to sing. The sash is a song, it's a loyalist song. So they would sing it and they'd go, oh, okay. I get, never learned the Hail Mary. But. <laughs> get beat up if you didn't know the, yeah. the, the other side. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned your parents. Did your, didn't your father have some connection? He with did. He, um, he was actually, though he never said which organization he was in. I have a feeling he was in UDA. Um, and what they, liked was soldiers or ex soldiers they could train them how to use weapons and uh, he uh, I think he trained a lot of the guys there um, they would have meetings twice a week so he would disappear on like a Tuesday and a Friday um, for four or five hours and then come back and I remember one time I was probably probably about 11 or 12 and there was a knock at the door, and it was the police, it was the RUC. The Royal Ulster Constabulary. Yeah. And we were sitting in the living room, and my dad, the color just went from his face. And I'd never seen that before. And he says, uh, he, t he said to my mom, run up, run up the stairs and get into that cupboard and take that bag and put it in the cold bunker. He says, go on, do it now, go on, do it now. So she goes up the stairs, and she brings down this plastic bag and out the back door. And over there, we have coal fires, but you have like a coal bunker, a shed where you store your coal. And so she goes in and, and throws the, the bag in there and covers it with coal. And he, he, in the meantime, he answers the door, and it, and it was about, you know, they were asking some questions about some, some guy they were looking for or whatever. Um, but he was terrified that they had you know, heard that he had guns or what have and were coming for him. And uh, so after they left, he sent me out and I went and got the bag. And I looked in it and there was a, there was a handgun and there was a, a Sterling submachine gun Whoa. with a load of bullets that he had uh, been stashing. Hmm. these guys so that was a, that was a close call because then you would have got a lot of time for that yeah speak to the police and the allegations of collusion with loyalist paramilitaries um, did the police play both sides of the street, sometimes coming down hard on loyalists, other times seemingly giving them the green light to go to do what they wanted? Yeah, and I think... Both sides. Yeah, and I think there was a lot, especially if they were after somebody, if they were after a Republican, and for some reason that they, they couldn't get him, they would definitely use the UVF or the UFF or whoever it was. And, and give them information that would uh, allow them to go and uh, to go get someone. To go and get someone, and then sometimes arrest those same people and send them to prison. Exactly. How how did it feel for a loyalist to be used? Well, clearly used, right? Yeah, I mean they, I, I, you know, they were a Protestant force, but in some they were they were not liked. Um, they, because of exactly what they were doing, because they, they wanted to show that they were making, they wanted to show that they were somewhat fair, or pretending to be fair. So they would do that, but they would set these guys up. And it, you know, it wouldn't be the top guys, because they knew not to do that. Mm. You know, it'd be a lot of these young guys that were sent out, and, you know, I, and I remember, this was early on, this was in 72, one of my best friends, his two older brothers were high up. Um, 
and they sent this older brother out. Um, he was one of the Dodds. He was, he, which was Johnny Adair's right hand uh, man, okay. Winky Dodds. Um, and he went up to this house. You know, this is supposedly the house of an IRA man, and knocked on the door, and the guy opened the door, and he shot him dead. The cops came right round and arrested him. And uh, he was probably about 19 or 20 at the time. And uh, they gave him a life imprisonment. And uh, that was North Belfast, wasn't it? Yeah. I think I know the man who was shot. Oh, you do? Oh. <laughs> it was a mistake. He shot the wrong one. Is that right? He shot the wrong. If that's the same one. Yeah, I mean, Paralyzed that guy but... spent. Um, I don't know how many, 20, 25 years, whatever it was, inside. And I remember his younger brothers, because we, you know, they lived beside us and we grew up together. And he went up to visit him one time in the prison. And this is a guy I'd been in for probably about 15 years at this time. And he was still dressed in the 70s stuff, you know, he hadn't a clue what was going on <laughs> outside. And uh, he said to his younger brother, you know, he was probably about 17 at the time or something like that. Don't you know there's a war going on? This is the guy stuck in a cell. <laughs> and uh, you know, what are you doing? Because he was thinking of going away to London as well uh. at that time. And uh, it was that mentality that you can't. The other thing is a lot of these guys that have done these things think that they're owed something. You know, they, you know, mm. they sacrificed mm. X amount of years of their life. Uh, or, you know, got injured, you know, for the cause or whatever. And, you know, they're out there, they're still running around. And, you know, I'm, I mean, if you've been reading the papers now, you'll, you know, you find that there's a, still a lot of stuff going on. It's a little more diminished now than it was, you know, a few years back. But, you know, they're not, they're not dead and buried by any means. It's interesting, as, as Chris is talking about this, occurs to me, that on the Protestant side, it's much more complex. That Protestant members of the paramilitary groups are defend, defending Elster, but their own neighbors look down on them and kind of regard them as being quasi-gangsters. Um, the police use them and then send them to jail. And the police might arrest them for having possession of guns in one case, but encouraging them in them to have guns in other cases. Whereas in the Republican side, it's much more, it's simple. It's us and them, and there aren't that many gray areas. It, would you speak to that? Is that? Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with that. I mean, there, there is an agenda there, there is a cause there, um, and there's a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, on the loyalist side, it seems to be like a hodgepodge of things, and everybody's, you know, Climbing on top of each other to you know to get, get whatever position, um, but yeah, I would agree with that. There is definitely uh, you know a, a black and white when it comes to um, the Republican side. Um, they're more focused, um, better trained. Uh, I mean, you know, they're. I mean, they're probably the best Irish group in the world. Um, yeah. I, mean, I mean, the British Army yeah. couldn't yeah. defeat them. Couldn't defeat them in 38 years. Um, um, so, I mean, they, they are disciplined, and I mean, you have to admire that at some level. You know, as we go into this area, we should look back a little bit in history. Um, in some ways, the troubles really began in 1966 because that's the year that Ian Paisley, Reverend Ian Paisley, uh, told the police they had to take an Irish tricolor flag out of a shop on the Falls Road, which was the main thoroughfare uh, into the Catholic neighborhood uh, in West Belfast. And uh, it became a kind of a, of a departing point. I, I've had police officers tell me that if Paisley hadn't insisted on taking that tricolor out of the window. The troubles may not have ever happened because I don't know, like six people were killed as a result of the riots yeah. and, and you know, it, it really got things off to a, a very volatile 
uh, beginning in 1966. You were then, what, two years old. Mm -hmm. But you must have heard about that, right? Oh, yeah. And I what mean, did you hear? It's, and, and it's a f famous thing. You know, he became like a folk hero after that. I mean, he, you, you know, the Protestant community just kind of, you know, um, surrounded them and, uh, you know, embraced them um, because he was standing up. You know, this is part of Great Britain. This is part of the Union. You know, that's a you know a Southern Republican flag. It shouldn't be he flying here in the North. Um, and yeah, that, he he really ignited a lot of that. Um, you know, my my parents didn't like him. Even my dad didn't like him. And my mom especially didn't like him. You know, here's that mouthpiece again, because you know, that's all he would do. He'd get up in his soapbox and he'd rant and rave and just, you know, hellfire and brimstone, you know, and, you know, stop the, you know, this uh, Republican nightmare. It's, you know, everything was fear. Everything was fear. Everything he espoused was, you know, negative. Um, and it's funny, towards the end, he like softens, and he was, you know, the one that was like, let's bring, you know, Sinn Féin in, and, you know, let's do this thing. I mean, you, you could make a case that the same man who started the conflict <laughs> ended the conflict. That's you know, what's he so would pull the flag out of the, insisted the police pull the flag out of the shop on the Falls Road, and then made a deal to, to share power with Sinn Féin with the likes of Martin McGuinness, who everyone knew had been the chief of staff of the IRA. So why did he make that transition? I mean, I don't know if you have a, well, that, a theory that, on that. And then that goes back to like, what was that all about, really? I mean, all what these wasted all lives and you come full circle, you know, the back to square one. You know, it, it just, it's, it baffles me how that, how that, uh, how that happened. And, um, you know, you, you, I mean, I would have had more respect for him if he had stood by what he had espoused all those years and said, you know, never or whatever. But to, to like, look back at that and all those people that were killed and maimed and um, driven from their homes and stuff, just to go let your par. You know. you know, one of the people at Queens uh, in the political science department made the comment that the Troubles was about everything and nothing. Everything to do with life, every aspect of your life. But on the other hand, what was it all about? Mm -hmm. And after a while, you had to say, don't know. And you know, I don't know if you remember, I talked about this before, that I brought some students over from Belfast, both Protestants and Catholics, and they went out to, here in Oregon, we took, I took them out to Cornelius, Oregon, and they met with a group of Mexicans, young people, and the Mexican young people said, what's it all about? What, what, what's the issue? And, and they couldn't answer it. Neither the Catholics nor the Protestants could give an answer, and it bothered them, because they didn't have a clue what mm. it was about, even though their whole lives had been shaped by this conflict that divided everyone but you couldn't list what it was about. Not really. Yeah, and I think that's true, that, you know, these people were immersed in that, and they, they were so, you know, wrapped up in it that they didn't know. I mean, they lost themselves in it. They didn't even know what it was about. It's just, oh, this has to be done, mm -hmm. or we have to do it this mm -hmm. way. There was no mm -hmm. question in any of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what needs to happen. I mean, you know, I, you know, I would, I would say I'm a nationalist. I mean, if I, if I had to, you know, put a label on myself, I mean, I, I would like to see a united Ireland. How did you come by that? Well, I think it comes from my view about social injustices and stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's what interests me. Religion, to, you know, I'm a devout atheist, you know. I'm, you know, um, I, I think that's... Um, of course, there'd be a lot of people doing the fighting and dying on both sides who would be atheists as well, wouldn't there? 
Well, that's the whole they thing. I mean, people, church, t people talk about, uh, you know, this religious war, but, I mean, and you can speak to this too, but, I mean, I didn't see any UVF men or UDA men going to church on a Sunday. And you probably didn't see or hear of any IRA <laughs> men going to Mass. Um, but, uh, you know, I think people like John Hume really tried to do something, and, you know, I mean, improve people's lives and, and, and justice, you know, equal justice for everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, he was right there from the get-go. And I didn't, you know, realize, you know, my political thoughts, you know, didn't start to surface until I was probably about 15, 16. And, uh, you know, and I kept that to myself. I didn't, you know, tell anybody about that. But um, You kept that to yourself? Yeah. Yeah, and I still have. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I my cousin comes over every year, and you know, he lives in uh, London, uh, or he lives in uh, North England now. And he keeps sending me all this, you know, oilist stuff, you know, the Ulster flags and the Rangers tops and all this here. Stuff. Rangers are our football team. Protestant football team, yeah. And uh, you know, he wants me to put the flag out even over here. <laughs> In Newburgh, on the 11. <laughs> <laughs> Wonders like, why you don't have like, a bonfire the yeah, night of the 11. Like anybody would know what that was. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, he. We talked about the election, like you said. This is this is probably the best that time to be studying. You know, the the conflict and that with the election coming up. But you know, he's staunch conservative. You know, he's uh, you know right down the line because you know. He's a loyalist and, you know, he wants us to be part of the union forever. Um, and I've always been, you know, I've always, my leanings have always been towards Labour, although this Labour, the Labour government of Tony Blair is definitely not the Labour. Yeah. But you I looked did. beyond what was going on. I did. I, I looked at, yeah, I took a lot of that out of, out of the equation. Okay. Uh, a lot of, you know, the tribalism mm -hmm. out of the equation, and I looked at people's lives and, and what was happening to people in these neighborhoods on both sides, and thinking that, you know, this is this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think the only person, like I said, the only person I felt was doing anything about um, that situation was uh, John Hume. John Hume, that we can talk about in a moment. Yes, a question. Yes, uh, I recently learned the term uh, playing the orange card, wherein uh, unionists kind of uh, pit working class Protestants and Catholics against each other to keep them from uh, uniting. And so I'm actually curious, um, my question is, is uh, you know, do you think that the powers that be in Northern Ireland use the conflict as kind of a tool to keep the working class people down? Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. Very good um, question. Yeah, definitely. The, yeah, they use that to keep them in place and, and, and uh, you know, keep their votes and keep those guys in place too. I mean, I would definitely agree with that. Um, and they've done it for a long time and they know, you know, what buttons to push and they do. And, and working class Catholics and working class Protestants have a lot in common in terms of their strong socialist background in both communities, uh, strong labor, uh, both political party and unions, you know, um, and there's been that, that, that long experience on the part of management to play the orange card, and the orange card would be the threat to Protestant workers that if you do a deal with Catholics, they're going to come and take your job. Mm -hmm. So it behooves you if you want to continue working at the shipyards or the rope works or whatever it is. If you, if you want the job your father had, then keep the Catholics out. And the brutal truth is the jobs are gone. And the Protestant workers, their, their preparations for other jobs just aren't there. So here they are, with, the jobs are gone, and the Catholics didn't take him after all, but uh, the only thing they have left to do is to blame the Catholics because, you know, times are bad and they're the ones who must be responsible. Is that mm -hmm. simplistic yeah. thinking? Or and, and, yeah, and I, I agree, because they don't think beyond that. And it's not like, 
okay, well, you know, you're, we're part of this union, right? Um, so why don't we have any contracts from, from Britain for, for building some ships, mm -hmm. Harlan and Wolf, mm -hmm. or, you know, for the Navy or whoever mm -hmm. it may be? Mm -hmm. um, they, they don't think about those things. They, they, they blame the Catholics, and then, you know, when, when, when the Republic had that, you know, huge influx of um, foreign workers. Foreign workers. And, the Republic, um, of course, being the 26 counties in the south. And um, it doing well for itself, you know, with the, with the tag industry and stuff like that. Um, the people in their north were just like, what, you know, what, how, you know, what happened to us? Mm -hmm. Why were we left mm -hmm. there? Why, mm -hmm. you know, why didn't we get mm -hmm. a, a piece of this? Mm -hmm. And instead of looking internally and, and blaming, you know, your neighbors or your co-workers, I mean, you got to look to Westminster, to London, over the sea, um, because I mean, uh, that's where a lot of that stemmed from. Um, I. You know, I, I mean, when I left um, Northern Ireland, it was 27% uh, unemployment. Um, and, you know, there was just young guys hanging out on the street corners. I mean, you know, just bored, you know, waiting for something to do. I mean, it was easy pickings for these paramilitary groups. You know, just tell them to go, you know, pick them up and send them out on the job and give them a few beers or whatever. You know, um, it was, uh, you know, it was tough back then. And uh, it, things are a little better now, but, you know, I think it's a, a long way off before. You know, as, as Chris is talking, I'm thinking about if you're growing up as a Protestant in Northern Ireland, you hear stories that the Catholics are the ones who have been discriminated against, and that's true. But if you go into working class neighborhoods today, you'd find more desperation in Protestant neighborhoods. Tiger's Bay, mm -hmm. Old Park, I mean, we're talking houses that are bricked up, in some cases houses gone, a whole square block gone. You know, the houses got so bad, so rat infested, so beat up that they just moved in and took them down. So the unemployment rate is high, the housing is poor, the educational levels are poor, and the Protestants are saying, I thought we were in charge. I thought we were running this place. And now they're in a situation where they're asking themselves, what went wrong? And all they can conclude, as you kind of suggested already, is to blame the Catholics. And in fact, it's, it's a lot more complex than that. It, it goes to the heart of the Unionist Party. It goes to the heart of industry in Northern Ireland. It's, it's a really complex issue. And it's not something you can you know, click off the reasons right off the top. And I think the other thing with the, with the um, nationalist side is, is that they knew they were, weren't going to get any help. So they helped themselves. They had social programs set up. Um, they educated their people. Um, you know, they relied on themselves. Where on the Protestant side, it was this entitlement thing, and whoa, what a, you know, yeah. you know, what, should we just get this? Yeah. Um, and that's all gone. A lot of that's yeah. gone. Yeah. 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 Most of it's gone. Yeah. Another question. Do you think that? Um, some of the people who believed in these issues for so long, it would be hard for them to even conceive that it might not really be about anything. Like they've given so much of their lives to this that the thought that it's not really real would just be too, like they can't even really conceive it in their head. Does that make sense? Yeah. And has, I have a, two, a second part to that. Has anyone really gone in and made an exerted effort to try to explain, like, do you see that this isn't really about anything, anything tangible or real? Yeah, that's a good question. Very good. Um, yeah, I think that's true. I think that they're so far into it um, that uh, you know they can't you know rationalize anymore. You know, stand back. Um, and, I mean, it just becomes their whole life. It's it's everything they are. Um, and you know, there's been efforts 
you know, um, like the peace efforts and stuff like that, mm -hmm. where you know they tried to you know talk about it and get communities together and that. But it is it, that's that's a really good point. They're so into it that it's just they can't they won't listen to reason, uh, and they they won't even entertain it. And it's probably not just an idea of having the old people die off because the young people will be more analytical. Young people are perhaps just as caught up in this as the older people, aren't they? Yeah, and that's what I was saying. It surprised me that, that, that these young guys and I are, are getting caught uh, with arms or, you know, or, or doing paramilitary activity. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking. And drugs. And drugs. Oh, that's a, a, big a drugs. real big thing. Um, and you know that's all run by the paramilitaries, all that. Um, you know, they, they try to portray this image of, you know, defending the union or whatever. And uh, really it's a bunch of gangsters that are, are lying in their pockets. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's interesting that the, the only people who have a personal memory of a time when there was some sharing and, and, and moving across neighborhoods are people who were adults before 1966, 69. I mean, you have to be that old to be able to tell a story that I used to be able to walk down so-and-so street with no fear at all. Now that's no longer true. Yeah, and that's a, re a really good point. So the, the old ones are the ones that have kind of a, of a, a more, what would you call, ecumenical uh, experience in their lives. Another question. Yeah, uh, I mean, most of this took place before I was even born, so I didn't really have any like fathoming of the political environment. But I mean, the, the experience we that like my generation has with this kind of thing, you know, we think of like you know Palestine and the occupation, and you know, not having the right to self determination. Was there much of an international solidarity movement for for nationalists, or was it more just isolated to Ireland? Or I mean. Was there was the people outside of Ireland like heavily pushing for either side, or was it very much isolated to just in the country? Good question. Well, you know, um, <laughs> no red. Uh, yeah, the uh, the, the tell Republican. Us, tell us what no is. Yeah. I don't know what it's it, Northern Irish aid. Northern Irish aid. Yeah. It's they were fundraisers for the for the IRA. And in the United raised, States. They raised a lot of money for the IRA. And there was a lot of sympathy for the IRA. Um, some of these weapons that were just fine were <laughs> from Libya. Uh, you remember that when, when Libya was at kind of a quasi-war with Britain, uh, Colonel Gaddafi. Um, so there was sympathy, definitely sympathy um, um, outside. But that was more against, well, there's a big, huge Irish lobby over here. I mean, the Irish have huge clout over here in the States. Um, and there's a lot of countries out there that don't like Britain. So they'll support any, any resistance to Britain. Um, on, the, on the Protestant side, I wouldn't say there was much, maybe a little something in Canada or something, you know, yeah, from some of the Scotch-Irish, but not that much. they, no. That, that's, a, that's another thing where where the Catholics seemingly have advantages because the Irish who came to Chicago and Boston and, and LA and other big cities remembered that they were Irish and they gave money to Norade and other people that buy guns for the IRA. Protestants, on the other hand, don't have that outside interest group to help them out. So they've kind of felt like they were you know, on their own. Uh, so you get more and more this complicated convoluted, contradictory side on the Protestant side. And, you know, it's, it's not hard to see why they kind of feel like their backs are up against the wall. Because all these things tend to sort out and favor the nationalist side. Another question. I was just going to ask that, um, because you grew up with all this hostility and everything, and you moved away to England when you were 19, I believe, and then you have these other Catholics that have moved out and have started you know, uh, groups and all this support for the effort abroad, when you were taken out of everything, out of all this hostility, and you were able to just be, how is it you're so objective, but these other, the other side isn't, has left and isn't so objective as you have been of the conflict? 
Uh, I think getting away helped me a lot. <laughs> Your wife? You, well, uh, you, getting away. Oh, and, getting away. And, okay. and, and other people, you know, I surrounded myself with people that kind of thought similar to what I did. Um, I mean, I have friends over here, um, Catholic friends. Um, but we never talk about this. I mean, I have a friend from uh, Newry, and uh, which is really a strong nationalist city, right on the border. And you know, we you know shared a house together for years and and and, and stuff like that. But never once did we ever bring up anything about the troubles are the are, are over there. And you know, we had friends that were from the south, and some you know people from England and that, who would ask these really awkward questions, you know, you have a couple of beers and it's like, mm. Oh. Mm. and even no matter what, me and Sean just, we, we would never get into that, and uh, I don't know if we'll ever have a conversation like that, but, you know, I've known Sean, I don't know, 15, 16 years, and, we know each other, but we don't really know each Okay. <laughs> I, I'm curious whether you've had this experience that many northern Protestants who go abroad, and they say, I'm from Ireland, and right away the assumption is that they're Catholics. And if you had that happen in your life, people oh, kind yeah. of treat you as though you must be Catholic because you're Irish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I remember, uh, you know, I was on the East Coast for a while, and... Uh, Never celebrated St. Paddy's Day in Northern Ireland, ever, <laughs> ever. But I wanted to, I wanted to start in Boston for okay. St. Paddy's Day. Uh. It's like the second biggest parade in the States. You know, there's like 100,000 people at this. And you just walk along and everybody's doors open. And they got kegs just <laughs> sitting there. And they all got their orange sweaters on and their, you know, their little caps and you know, everybody's in there just boozing away. And you can't even say that to somebody back home. No. What do you mean you want to celebrate yeah, yeah, Paddy's yeah, Day? Yeah, you know? yeah. But, I mean, that's the, ex I mean, that's the extremes, that, the prejudice that, you know. Have you ever had a really intelligent conversation with Americans about Northern Ireland? <laughs> Just you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to be slanted, but you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, your friends in Newburgh or Portland or thereabouts? Not in depth. I mean, it's hard for, it's hard for me to understand, it's, you know, and, you know, for an outsider, it's, I mean, it must be mind-boggling, it's just, but, uh, yeah, there's, you know, people, there's people that are interested in, in you know, I talk, you know, and give them as much information as they want until their eyes roll over. And then You've never been invited to the Rotary Club or something like that to make a presentation? No. Okay. <laughs> no. Yeah. But maybe after this tonight. <laughs> um, again, going back in history, um, in 1967, 68, the Northern Civil Rights Movement began where the students at Queens Mm -hmm. uh, who were really inspired by the American Civil Rights Movement were singing We Shall Overcome and that kind of stuff. And you were, what, four years old or so mm -hmm. at the time. But you must have heard about that. What, what did you hear about the civil rights? And what did you hear about Bernadette Devlin, who was one of the leaders of the Civil Rights Movement? Yeah, I, I mean, there definitely was that going on. Um, and I, I, you know, I didn't know that that was coming from the States. Um, you know, Davlin, mm -hmm. like you said, was was at the forefront of Hume was there and they were going on these marches and, you know, it was civil rights they were marching for. It was not, you know, there was, I mean, everybody was welcome to that. Anybody was disenfranchised. Um, and they twisted that into something that they claimed that it was a Republican thing. It was a nationalist thing. It was. It wasn't a civil rights thing. It was. A, they want to take over. They want the North back. Mm. You know, they want mm. the six counties back. Um, 
And then there was that uproar on our side to all this, because they twisted it and they, and, they, and they made it seem that, you know, this, this was a smoke screen. It's not civil rights. They, they, they want our jobs. They want the North back. Um, when you say they, who, do you, who are you thinking? You I'm, follow thinking us of, in terms I'm thinking of about Paisley and his ilk okay. and, and what's his name, the Reverend Martin. That other one, the Orange Order. The oh, uh, uh, I know he means South Belfast. Yeah. He was a member of Parliament for a while. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of those were, were um, up in arms about it. And uh, and people were, you know, the, in the in the North, they were receptive to receptive to that kind of dogma. You know, it, it played into their fears and and. Uh, you know, they were all ready to fight it. To because the civil rights movement, when it started, really could have benefited both working class Protestants and Catholics. Because if you didn't own property, it didn't make a difference whether you're Protestant or Catholic. You couldn't vote. And some people who owned a lot of property had as, li as many as 10 or 12. I think one guy had 11 votes in Derry uh, because he owned a lot of property and had a, de uh, a degree from the university, he got a vote there. So. It would have benefited a lot of people on both sides, but ultimately, within six months or so, it sorted out that, as you're suggesting, it was said to be something that would benefit Catholics, that they were trying to take over all of Ireland, that it was going to be, you know, unified Ireland, and Protestants were going to be, were going to be discriminated against as a result of that. And, and, and yeah, like you said earlier, well, I mean, there was Protestant slums. Mm-hmm. And Catholic oh, yeah. stamps, I mean, just, oh, yeah. just as bad. Um, so, I, I mean, that was a movement that would have benefited everybody, like you said. You know, we, we're going to talk a little bit more about history when we come back, but we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the march at Burnt Hollet in 1969. As I recall, January 69, where mm -hmm. off-duty police officers and loyalists beat up a number of people, including Bernadette Devlin. And then finally, uh, the uh, bloody Sunday of January of 1972. And 1972, as you remember, is, was really the bloodiest year of the conflict. That's where more people were killed than any other year. The, the, it, it spiked in terms of the number of people killed on both sides. So, uh, we'll take a break for just a few minutes, and we'll come back. Good. We're back again with Chris Robinson and uh, talking about Northern Ireland. And we'd like to start off with uh, questions from the floor. So, uh, I think at least two of them that I think we have lined up. Starting off. Sure. Um, my question was over the break, why is it after 400 years of Protestants living in, in Northern Ireland, is there still such a loyalty to Britain today? Good question. That is a good question. Very good. Yeah, it's something that I don't understand because um, I, I have lived in, in uh, Britain for a number of years and um, I know the way um, they treat people from the north. Um, and I can't understand how you would be loyal to uh, something like that. Um, I just think that they um, have been um, brainwashed and been fed this dogma and um, that's all they know and that's all they want to know. Um. Uh, you know, the English started this separation, well, when did they start it? Hundreds of years ago. Um, and they can't seem to stop it. They can't, they can't undo what they started. And uh, I don't suppose there'd be a group that would be more willing to let the Northern Irish go and do their own thing than the people in London, the, the leadership in, the, in both parties in London, uh, and all the parties in London. Uh, but it's something that they can't seemingly turn the clock back and, and gain any kind of uh, you know, distance on the conflict so that people would become uh, more willing to tolerate each other. Mm. We have another question from the floor. Um, yes, actually this is a good follow-up question. Um, I found this on the internet and it's dated April 6, 2010, this month. It's a joint statement from Sir Reg, Reg? 
Reg M Empey? Reg Empey, leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, mm -hmm. and the Right Honorable David Cameron, leader of the Conservative Party. And they're talking about the election that's coming up uh, next month. And they, they want to combine the Conservative and the uh, Ulster Unionist Party forces because they want, they feel that Northern Ireland is stuck on the margins of UK politics. And they say that Gordon Braun's labor government is neutral on the union. So um, they feel that the, if they ally, uh, the unionists and the conservatives, says offers us the chance to end Northern Ireland's semi-detached political status and it, they feel it gives them the opportunity to realize, they, as they put it, one of the unionism's most cherished object, objectives, equal citizenship for all the people of Northern Ireland. But at the end, they say, at this election, it is only by backing the conservatives and the unionists that you can vote to put Northern Ireland at the heart of the union. So. Um, these people still very much seem to want to be united to Britain, whether Britain wants them or not. So how yeah. much backing do they have? Yeah. Um, the, the way the DUP looks at that is uh, MP and, um, and the Ulster Unionists want to give away a lot. Uh, they would want to concede a lot to the Nationalists and the Republicans. Um, the DUP don't. Um, they don't want any part of that. Um, and they um, portray themselves as the party of the Union and of the Ulster people. And MP and Trimble before him have had their day and they're no longer valid politically. Um, that's why you have the two extremes now. That's why you have the DUP, and that's why you have Sinn Féin. Um, because the people have voted um, through fear, whatever it was, and they have completely divided. Um, now, they're, they're trying to um, come up with deals and, and partnerships that will bring them back to par, but the reality is that they're probably a shot party. And they're 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 on their way down. Um, I think the DUP may actually get another seat. Uh, possibly. Possibly. So um, I think it's a a desperation move, and I think people are seeing it that way. Or the DUP is definitely projecting it that way. Um, and and you know, Sinn Féin's doing the same on the other side. Um, you know, the SDLP might be in a little bit of trouble too. It's interesting that you've lived in England and in Northern Ireland. And as a Westminster election comes up in England and Scotland and Wales, they're talking about foreign policy, they're talking about union wages, right to organize, education, environment, all sorts of issues. But when we're talking about Northern Ireland, we're talking about one issue, the Union or United Ireland. True mm -hmm. statement? And yes. to some extent, are the Northern Irish missing out on politics because they're one-dimensional? That's a very good point. And, and, you know, so you have these Sinn Féin elected uh, representatives who don't sit in Westminster. I mean, they don't even go there. Um, they represent their constituents. Um, so, I mean, how are you going to change anything with yeah. that attitude? Yeah. I mean, you've got the DUP that won't you know, concede anything um, to the Republicans or the Nationalists, and then you've got the, the Republicans that won't even take a seat when they're elected. So it's... it's mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's one of these strange things. You can spend years and years and years in Belfast and never hear a good debate on taxation or foreign policy or education. I mean, it's, if it's education, it's a question of whether kids go to 
uh, to a whether they pass the 11 plus, which is which has become a kind of a sectarian issue in itself. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're missing out on the chance to represent themselves. And if the two communities had some sort of commonality, they'd recognize that they stand together on many issues and could use their muscle politically. But that never has happened. No, Hasn't happened and, and the parties years. that try to do that, like the Lions Party, I mean, they are so <laughs> You know, they go down. They're yesterday's people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any yeah. any um, concessions is always a sign yeah. of weakness yeah. on either side. He mentioned John Hume and the SDLP. I used to go to John Hume meetings and the SDLP, and they sounded a lot like the American Democratic Party. And they would talk about issues inside their group, but when they hit the streets outside, they talk about whether or not there's going to be United Ireland because they knew they couldn't get any votes by going through the conventional political issues. You have to go to the big one that inflames people on both sides. We, we talked earlier about, um, about Bloody Sunday and also about um, the Burnt Hollet March uh, that started out in Belfast in January of 1969 and ended up in Derry uh, after people had been beaten pretty badly. What did you hear about that when you were growing up? I know you were pretty young at this time. Yeah, well, what I heard was that it was an IRA march. Okay. It wasn't a civil rights march. It was the IRA. And they attacked uh, the soldiers. Uh, they started rioting. They started throwing stones and um, petrol bombs. Uh, they had a sniper, an IRA sniper on the roof that was shooting at the, uh, at the paratroopers. Um, this, is the, this is the version I got. And, uh, you know, they had to defend themselves. They were under heavy fire. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a huge mob, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Republicans. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't find out till years later. Um, that it was a civil rights march and that uh, the soldiers opened up and killed uh, 14 people, 13 that day and then one died later on. Um, and this is a government open, open and firing its own people. I mean, this is, you know, shooting their own citizens. Um, but the version we got was uh, these, these guys were out of control and, uh, you know, the soldiers were in danger and they were defending themselves. And, um, yeah, that was uh, probably one of the worst events. And Did the British government treat the Northern Irish differently than they treated any other part of the, of the British nation? Yeah, I would definitely. They were definitely... Um, looked down upon, they were definitely treated as second class citizens. Um, I mean, even on both sides, um, you know, when, when they first came over, I mean, they were, they were welcomed by the Catholic community, mm -hmm. you know, they were mm -hmm. bringing them out cups of tea, mm -hmm. you know, they were the saviors, they were going to, you know, stop mm -hmm. the Protestants from coming in their neighborhoods and, and burning them out and stuff like that. And then that all changed. Um, they, uh, you know, the Catholic community was seen as the enemies after that. Not to say that the, the soldiers were, you know, really friendly to the, to the Protestant community. They didn't care. They didn't want to be there. Mm. A lot of these mm. were young kids, mm -hmm. 17, mm -hmm. 18, who were sent over and they, you know, they didn't know what they were getting into. Um, so there was, they were tolerated, definitely tolerated more on the, on the Protestant side, but, uh, I wouldn't say they were, um, you know, well liked. So, so the British troops were catching hell from both sides. Yeah, yeah. And you know, the first person, the first British soldier killed was killed in a Protestant neighborhood. Yeah, and uh, you know, if you were keeping score, you'd find that the IRA killed more British soldiers and more police officers. But the Protestant paramilitaries got a few licks in as well. The police during this time, um, the RUC, the Ulster, the, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, 
plus a group we haven't mentioned yet, the UDR, the Ulster Defense Regiment. Both of these groups, the Ulster Defense Regiment dressed up in military uniforms, but they were local people. They looked like British soldiers, but they were local. Mm -hmm. And the RUC were, of course, also local. How did the people in your community, your parents perhaps, how do they see the police and the UDR? And then how did the people in your communities see the UDR? Well, there was definitely a separation between the two. The UDR, um, was tell us kind more of, about that. I just kind of tell us the UDR. In a way, it was like the UDA with guns, a legitimate and uniforms. Yeah, legitimate Protestant military. Okay, um, who would go out and target Republican areas, and um, any excuse to open fire, and they and they would without any doubt. I mean, they. They were probably more effective in a lot of ways than, than um, the UDA or the UVF or UFF. I mean, they had the legitimacy and um, they could go in and they could dispense their form of justice in Catholic communities like that. And they were always welcomed in um, Protestant, neighborhoods. Protestant neighborhoods. They, okay. they were never stoned or petrol bombed or anything. I mean, I knew guys that were in that. And these were staunch loyalists. It's, they're going, you know, this is this is the best scenario we could have. Uh, and it really was a good thing when they got rid of them, because they, they were out of control. As we're talking about the police and the UDR, as Chris is saying, virtually all of them were Protestants. Mm -hmm. You know, a very very small percentage would be would be Catholics. To some extent. If you were a Protestant, you had a chance to join the police or the UDR, which were a little bit more selective. They, you know, they didn't take you if they they didn't think you were going to represent the the government well. The people that they didn't take were the ones who went into the loyalist paramilitaries, mm -hmm. in a sense. So you really had a hierarchy of, in terms of respectable Protestants. Those who joined the police were perhaps the top rank, mm -hmm. then the UDR who could wear the uniform, and then the guys that were left over could join either the UVF or the UDA. If this is a true statement, what does it say about the hierarchy in, in Protestant neighborhoods and, and those who were doing the fighting and the dying versus those who had respectability? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Uh, you know, the, the RUC, um, they were probably taken from middle class Protestant uh, neighborhoods, for sure. Um, I think the UDR was more, more that working class. Um, they were more rough. Um, rough know, edges, yeah. Rough edges. Um, definitely wanted to bring the fight to the Republicans mm -hmm. and, and the nationalist community. Uh, and like you say, the, the, the bottom of the rung was, was the, you know, the ones that lived in the, in the Protestant ghettos, if you want to call them that. Um, and they wanted to fight too, but, the, but you know, they couldn't get into these legitimate organizations. So you know, the next best thing was to join these paramilitary groups. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, and these RUC guys, I mean, they lived in middle-class neighborhoods and, and, you know, they kept themselves to themselves. Um, the UDR, you would see uh, some UDR members in, in some of the estates and stuff like that, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the way it was stratified. It was a kind of a known fact that if the police were seeking loyalists who had committed a crime, their arrest rate was very high. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if they were seeking Republicans who had committed a crime, the arrest rate was much lower. Do you follow me? If so, why? Well, it, it was very hard for the police to operate in, in Catholic communities. 
very, very, they had to be super cautious when they went. And when they did go in, they went in with the full backup of the Army and the UDR. Uh, I mean, they would just be Land Rovers and Land Rovers of, of, of troops and, and police going into. With weapons out. With weapons out. The I mean, thing. they would just, you, you know, and they needed to. I mean, there was real, real danger when they went into those neighborhoods. Um, so, what what you had there was um, they they would the Catholic um, neighborhoods would be um, patrolled by uh, IRA members. I mean, they would take care of uh, any criminal elements within that community. Um, and the police, uh, the police knew that. I mean, these, the IRA, this was an organization who had a goal and, you know, it was to get the, the British out of the north to, to, to have a united Ireland and they didn't want any criminal element in their community. I mean, that was a distraction and they would not tolerate that. I mean, you know, these guys that would hijack cars and, and stuff and break into houses and stuff like that, they were they were um, punished severely for, for any of that. And, and the police knew that. Um, so those kind of crimes, they let the, the paramilitaries take care of that stuff. Um, when it was hunting for IRA men, I mean, they went in in force. If they had a tip off or, or something like that, um, they went in in force. So, so the police that were looking for loyalists Many of the police officers came from that same neighborhood, mm -hmm. and they would have known the loyalists by their first names, and maybe knew them when they were in secondary school together. Whereas, in the IRA, not only were the police not welcome there, they didn't know them, and no. they it, to be an informer on the Catholic side was to be marked for, you know, elimination. The IRA take care of you. That way. on the Protestant side, it was kind of more. You know, some people blew the whistle on their own friends and neighbors, and uh, they didn't, they weren't punished that much for it, were they? No. Um, and I mean, and, and they used each other, like we said earlier. I mean, uh, if they couldn't get to a target, um, the police would, would uh, you know, sequester some, you know, paramilitaries to do the work for them. And, you know, vice versa, I mean, you know, they would, they would tip off the police. The, the certain, you know, activities, you know, if there was two groups vying for, you know, um, a bit of turf or, or for, you know, whatever it may be, then, you know, one would ride out the other one, you know, just to get them out of the way. And so there was a lot of that, but there was definitely none of that on the, on the Republican side. On the side. Republican side. To, to some extent, the crime rate has gone up since the peace process. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, you made some reference to that a moment ago when you were talking about how the paramilitaries used to police their neighborhoods. I mean, I used to see signs saying, you know, don't, if you, if you misuse elderly people, we'll punish you. And those of you who, you know, hit so-and-so over the head when he was coming home with his groceries, we know who you are and we're going to come and get you. And, and they used to punish them by, by sometimes, you know, with, with pistols, uh, you know, shooting through the wrists or through the elbows or through the knees. Why has the crime rate risen since the peace process started? Well, I think, uh, like you said, Bill, the, these areas were, were um, controlled by the paramilitaries. Um, they instigated curfews, um, um, they had control of those neighborhoods and, and when the peace process um, uh, was instigated, um, they were very careful not to be caught doing any of that. Um, I mean there were severe penalties for any paramilitary activity uh, during this peace process. So they kept a low profile. Now, <laughs> The criminals loved that because then mm -hmm. they had a free hand to mm -hmm. kind of move around mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. um, things started to open up more. I mean, you know, the influx of drugs uh, is huge now. I mean, it's just rife in Northern Ireland. Um, so you had these guys that um, 
you know, would, that would go to England, uh, you know, buy drugs or, or go over to Amsterdam and buy drugs and bring these drugs back. And um, they had the ability to move around these neighborhoods where they didn't have before. Um, and the, you know, the paramilitaries saw that. I mean, there's still paramilitary activity going on. I mean, you got to realize that they're still in somewhat control of these neighborhoods. But now they're, they're kind of in league with these regular criminals, normal okay. criminals, whatever okay. you want to call them. Okay. So now they're splitting the profits, or they're taking that and giving a certain amount of these guys to go out and do these things. So to some extent, the cause on both sides has been, has been compromised by the attraction of money and drugs and gangsterism. Yeah. Um, and I would say more on the loyalist side than the, yeah. the I mean, the, you know, the Republicans still have, I mean, they have this group that goes and hunts down people that are dealing with drugs and, you know, takes care of them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely rife. Uh, there's money involved. I mean, I've, I talked to a friend of mine uh, who's a tiler over there. And he a, actually, a tiler, a yeah, laying tile. Laying okay. tiles, and he actually gets work from the UDA. They have a legitimate business where they have these, you know, a whole group mm -hmm. of guys that mm -hmm. do tiling for them, mm -hmm. and they pay a percentage to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure they're involved in a lot of other industries. I mean, I know they're into the gambling and and uh, the liquor business. Um, Videos, videos, and th yeah, all the black market and stuff. drinking clubs. And oh yeah, they still have their clubs. Although you know the hotels, and, and, and you know everyone's got their they 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 pay protection mm -hmm. in a sense, or or the paramilitaries might actually own the operation. So everyone knows that if you go into so and so place, you're giving money to the UDA or the IRA or whatever. As as you were. Just before you left, you were 19 or so when you left, mm -hmm. and you talked moments uh, before about um, recruiting people for paramilitary. What what kind of things did they use other than saying, you know, there's a war going on and you need to do your part? Well, well they uh, they they, uh, they would call you in. They would say, uh, you come and knock on your door, and uh, you got to come to a meeting on such and such a night. 6.30, 7 o'clock, whatever it was. And you, you, once you got that call, you had to be there, or you had to leave the country. And you knew what it was once you went, I mean, before you even went down there. Um, you know, they'd get you in there and, uh, you know, you'd swear allegiance and... Uh, so no choice? No choice, no. And was the swearing of allegiance to that particular group, like the UDA group, or UDF? Yep. Yep. And uh, you would be in that organization and you would have a commander and he would give you jobs to do, assignments, whatever it might be. It could be punishment beatings for somebody that stepped out of line. It could be an armed robbery. It could be a murder. You know, and uh, once you were in, you were in. There's a comparison you can make between paramilitaries on the Catholic versus the Protestant side. On the Protestant side, as far as I knew, there were like seven different commanders or brigadiers, as they called them, in Belfast alone that were almost completely independent of each other. Mm -hmm. On the Catholic side, the IRA was pretty much of a hierarchy. People at the top and people down the way took orders and carried out. Or Why the difference between the two? One decentralized, the other one very Cause centralized. Because I think, yeah, because I, th you know, I always, th you know, I come back to that. They seem so disorganized and so scattered. And, you know, everyone wanted to be on top. You know, we talked about Johnny Adair. You know, he wanted to be the number one guy. You know, but like you said, there was all, there was a... East Belfast Brigade leader, there was a South Belfast, there was North mm -hmm. Belfast. I mean, there was all these guys, there were all these... They didn't even communicate with they each other. They didn't talk, you know. No. And, um, yeah, they, um, you know, they all, they all wanted to be top dog. Um, and that, that's just that one organization, that's just the UDA. Now, you have the UVF on the other side. 
who had their areas like the, the Shanka um, and they had their own drinking bars. Now all these guys, these are all so-called loyalists, but you cannot go, you could not go in drinking in a bar that was owned by the UDA if you were in some other loyalist organization. They just would not tolerate that. And they knew all their members and they knew who was who. And uh, you know these bars could be under yards apart, the Shank Road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, so, yeah, I. You know, later on when we talk about education, we'll make the point that that the lower Shankle Road was controlled by the UDA, mm -hmm. and the upper part was by the UVF. And when the strife between the two became greater in the 1990s, families had to move, and kids at recess used to congregate. These are Protestant kids, UDA kids playing here, UVF kids playing over here, and then beating up each other after school. So. Again, I come back to that point, why this almost notorious decentralization on the Protestant side, on the Catholic side? Boy, if there was a spat, someone visited you and you better stay in line. Mm -hmm. You get one chance maybe to be out of line and not be punished. Second time, you're out of there. Yeah, um, I think there definitely was that division in the Protestant community. I mean, like we touched on earlier, I mean, you had these groups like the UVF who had that history of fighting in the First World War and, and you know, well respected and, um, you know, these were the guys that were really going to defend us. Where you had these other guys like the UDA who were just, you know, the, the local yahoos that mm -hmm. walked around with sticks mm -hmm. and that. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you had that kind of animosity between these two groups. And I remember, I mean, you know, you probably want up the Shankle. I mean, they, have, they owned taxi companies. I mean, that was another way they made money. They had um, um, these black cabs that, you know, the, you'd you see in London if you've ever been to London. But one group, you know, you'd have the UDA taxis. You'd go to UDA <laughs> estates. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to go further, you had to walk over to the other taxi mm -hmm. cab stand mm -hmm. and get that one that's mm -hmm. going into the UVF mm -hmm. side. You know, mm -hmm. because this is where they generated mm -hmm. their funds, this is where mm -hmm. they got money from. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was the same with, um, you know, the, the, the pubs and, the, and their clubs and gambling and stuff like that. Um, so, I, I, think, I think a lot of it stemmed from, you know, their traditions and their histories. And, uh, you know, you know, one saying, well, you know, we're the old school, we've been around, so, mm -hmm. you know, we were mm -hmm. in the First World War, and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we were there defending the people, mm -hmm. and, and the other one goes, well, well, you know, we're the new kids on the block, mm -hmm. and, 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 you mm -hmm. know, we've got the backing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of the people at night, and, and there, was, there was a lot of that. I mean, there was a lot of infighting, there was a lot of <laughs> murders, you know, loyalist murders, I mean, you know. You know that. I mean, there was a lot of UDA killing UVF and vice versa. And, um, you know. Do you think there's some relation between religion, tra religious traditions, and, and political behavior? On the Catholic side, you got the Pope, you got the cardinals, and you got the bishops and the priests and the nuns, and you pretty much stay within the fold because if you leave, you, you got nowhere to go. If you're ex-Catholic, you're outside, you're excommunicated. On the Protestant side, you got, you know, the Reformation gave a lot of different people the right to read the Bible and decide mm -hmm. which direction to go. And, you know, you don't tell a Protestant if you're out of the church, you're going to go to hell. So Protestants have this tradition of, of having a lot of different choices. And the choices turn out to be a disadvantage in some respects mm -hmm. if you're trying to run a paramilitary organization. So y you follow I that? A, I think that's a good point. Um, I think that's true to a large extent. I mean, you know, the Anglican Church, the way that's split up. Oh, yeah. You know, you got yeah, the Presbyterians yeah. and the Methodists yeah. and the Lutherans and all yeah. that stuff. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's a kind of a mirror of the, of the, the power struggle and the political struggle on, on the loyalist side, because there is that so-called freedom. Well, mm -hmm. you know, you know, yeah. 
you know, we have the ability to do what, what we want to do in, you know, our way, the, the best way, or whatever. And, I mean, they've suffered from that. I mean, it's, it's been really detrimental to it. It is, it is. I mean, I, I think, I mean, if the British Army wasn't there, it would be no contest. <laughs> you, you, you know, all these things are interesting. One of the themes that we're pursuing tonight is how many cases or situations is there kind of an inherent advantage that the nationalists have and a somewhat inherent disadvantage on the Protestant side, even though the people living there wouldn't see it that way. If you're an outsider looking in, you can see there are some differences that benefit one side and, and tend not to benefit the other side. Yeah, I would definitely um, say that there's more cohesion on the Republican side. They do have an agenda and a focus, and they've mm -hmm. stuck by that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on the Protestant side, there is that entitlement thing, yeah. and we don't really need to do anything, and everything's going yeah. to be great. You know, Westminster's yeah. going to take care of us, or London, or yeah. whatever. And, um, I mean, they still think that, which is really weird. You know, a moment ago, Chris was talking about the black taxis, uh, the U UVF and the UDA black taxis difference. You know, there's conflict between them. On the Republican side, there's one set of taxis, and the IRA runs them. It's an open secret. And if you're a driver on the Catholic side, you kick back. The last thing I knew was 90 pounds a week. And that's about $200. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money to come out of your pocket. Yeah. And that, I know right where they take the money. Mm -hmm. And all the drivers go in there once a week and they divvy up their money. On the Protestant side, there's probably skimming taking place, but it isn't that well organized. It isn't that well structured. So again, you get this difference of behavior depending on different backgrounds, perhaps. And, and you have a lot of this renegade stuff. Um, you know, they curate these organizations, like the new, I mean, if you look through your leaf, there's a million <laughs> new Protestant bar oh, yeah. groups. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. You know, they come out and, and they get a bond of guys, you know, and all of a sudden they're this new organization and uh, they've got their agenda and they get set up um, and they're tolerated for a while until they, you know, piss somebody off mm -hmm. and then they're, you know, taken mm -hmm. care of or whatever. Mm -hmm. But on the Catholic side, you, you never see that. No. I mean, on the you, nationalist side. A, a few dissidents, but you can you know the IRA is watching them closely. And you know that they don't, their leash is pretty short. And they're able to do a few things, uh, but you know, there's a unity on that, on that nationalist side. It sometimes borders on dictatorship, but it does keep the folks together. You know, you don't have too many people going off in different directions. Um, you were gone before the peace process really started. Mm -hmm. and, but you were watching it from the outside. Did you think it was going to succeed or do you still think it might fall apart? What, what's your feeling about the peace process and, and the process of uh, bringing both sides together and sharing power? And I think it's on really shaky ground. I can't see how the Republican and the nationalist community think that they have you know, got something more than they had. I mean, there might be a little, you, you know, okay, they get some representation, but they're still playing second fiddle. Why do you think they did it? You, you follow where we're going with this? He's saying, why did the nationalists agree to share power, to recognize the queen, to be part of a Westminster parliament that's in London, to, um, to join in with supporting the police, join in the police board, uh, all sorts of recognition that nationalists gave over to benefiting the British government and the preservation of the Union. You know, th this is a departure from, from what we've been saying. The nationalists seem to have all these advantages. Now we're saying, but in the 1990s, all of a sudden, they decided to become more cooperative with the British government. 
And today, you might even call them lap dogs, you know? They're, they're drawing money from the British Treasury and they're, uh, they're joining the police. You know, the, the goal is to have half the police be Catholic and now it's about 25%. So they're, they're moving in that direction. Why do you suppose the, uh, the Nationalists did this? I think they got a huge amount of pressure from, from the South and, and from, from Britain. Um, I think, to be honest with you, I think Adams and, and McGuinness like the limelight. I really, I, I, and that's why you, you, you'll see now that a lot of these dissidents are in, you know, this real, real IRA or continuity IRA or whatever they're calling themselves, um, still very capable. Um, you know, they just targeted the MI5 ha headquarters there in uh, Hollywood, Last week, yeah. which is, you know, the MI5 is the CIA or the FBI mm -hmm. over here. I mean, they mm -hmm. went to their headquarters and set off a bomb. Yeah, we, last week we were talking about the bomb that went off at almost the exact moment that the Justice to power, powers were, were transferred, transferred to local hands. And so um, there's still that element there. Um, and, you know, I think that I'll, I'll concede that Adams and McGinnis are very smart men. Um, and they might be playing a waiting game. Uh, and and maybe send themselves okay. Well, you know, we'll swallow this for a while uh, until we're in a position where we can get what we want. Um, that might be the case. I, I, I'm not sure, um, but I know that they got a lot of pressure, and and probably Bertie Heron said to them, you know, you, we're not going to go anywhere with this. This is you know, this isn't going anywhere. That's just that's just. Take what they're going to give us, and then we can work from there, and maybe gain a little bit more as, as time okay. goes by. Do um, you think they felt they had gone far enough, or as far as well, they could go with the gun, and decided they had to use politics? I think so. I mean, not that they were ever defeated, but they definitely couldn't have won that war. I mean, you know, Britain would not have given up. I mean, they just want to, and they have all the resources. And it was I an mean, impasse on both sides. Yeah, both sides recognized the others. Yeah, couldn't and, be defeated. Yeah, and I think they, you know, they 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 did. They realized that they made some concessions, uh, um, but you know, a lot of the 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 hardcore Republicans really didn't want to swallow that pill. Okay. Um, and there was a report out there that you, you know it's all so you know this uh, um, so-called um, giving up of all the bombs it was nonsense. They, you follow they, the look of expressions we're they sharing They reckoned here. that uh, you all know, the guns are gone, right? Maybe, um, and this is coming from uh, this is coming from Special Branch that maybe the IRA give up sixty percent. So that's a huge amount of weapons. They could give up their old ones. Yeah, I mean that's a huge amount. And it, and it, and just to kind of put that in perspective, um, this was probably in the early eighties. Um, the Coast Guard intercepted a boat. Um, it was coming from uh, the south up into the north, and. It had 20 million pounds, which is about you know, 40 million dollars worth of arms on it for the IRA. And they didn't even bat an eye at that. That was like... You know, before so, we go to another question, talking about giving up guns, the, the, the word on the street was that both sides gave up dirty guns. And dirty guns would be ones that, that you could trace them to certain crimes because of the the velo what do you call it the the uh, the, the barrels and the, and the unique uh, what's the term the, the rifling and the barrels yeah the ballistics yeah, yeah. The ballistics. so both and and the agreement was that if you gave up guns we we're, we're not going to trace them we're not even going to look at them we're going to destroy them and so this would be a chance for you to give up your dirty guns and keep your clean ones and prepare for something that might happen later on and both sides did that. Question from the floor. I know this is kind of like an out there question, but how different do you think 
things would have turned out if you know they hadn't gone to such a armed fight? I mean, do you think they would have had a lot more support from the South, or did that not have a lot to do with um, them not having support? I mean, did the violence kind of uh, force people to one side or the other, or were they not so much worried about the violence in this? this Are you stating issue? what would have happened if the South would have gotten done a more passive? And, and, I, I, I approach it with a more passive, you know, um, peaceful resistance kind of way. Uh, I, I'm just curious if the if the violence really got people forced to one side or the other, or if that was just kind of expected and part of it. Do you follow? If that, that makes sense. No. What you're saying? What would I, I, I'm trying to figure out if you think you know the that the um, they wouldn't be in the position of giving up. You know, the the nationalists wouldn't be in the position of giving up a lot of these concessions and stuff. You know, back in the '90s, if they hadn't had such a fierce armed campaign. If they had focused more on you know passive, uh, passive ways to get what they wanted. Oh, would they have got what um, what they got without using a gun? Yeah, that, or if that, they might be in a different position now, do you think they'd be worse off? That, yeah, now? that's a that's a really good point. Uh, yeah, I mean they might have they might have got all the concessions they've got now without using that. I mean, I I don't think they've got that much, so. Depends on who you talk to. Whether you know the last last time we we talked about cross border bodies and how there are bodies set up between the north and the south that deal with all sorts of governmental functions in which you have set up co cooperation between mm -hmm. the north and the south, and and the IRA sees this as a really key thing because they they see the building of a united Ireland below the horizon. And on things like tourism and electrical grids and inland waterways, I mean, mm -hmm. all sorts of things that don't appear to be very important, but yet they set the standard of, of a north-south cooperation. And, and mm -hmm. they're banking their expectations that this is where the action is going to be. Mm -hmm. And so it won't be, you know, all of a sudden lowering the British flag and raising the tricolor. It'll be something that happens very slowly until it's too late to turn back. And that's, that's, you know, the people on the Falls Road in the Catholic um, section have spent a lot of time thinking about these things. And, you know, think tanks have concluded and set up papers and arguments. Um, and this, again, is, is an advantage, perhaps, that the Catholics have, that they've, you know, set up strategic type thinking mm -hmm. about things. Whether it'll work or not is something I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, getting back to that was a good point. Back when that started, I don't think the South was in any position to, to help the North. No. Now, if they had, if if they had had the economy that they have now back then, and and you know were as strong as they were, mm -hmm. then you, maybe they had had more sway mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. British. Um, but you don't take on the British. But, but yeah, no, and, and, and the thing is, I mean, they didn't want to take that whole mess of the north yeah. down to there. They were in no position, you know, economically or, to, to deal with that. So yeah, it might have been different. I mean, if they had been in a better position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let, let me ask you a series of, of people, how you, how you feel about people. First of all, you mentioned John Hume. What, what do you think of John Hume? Do you think he's a pivotal person in... Yeah, I, I really admire John Hume. Um, I was, uh, you know, really disappointed that, um, you know, he wasn't around. I mean, I had some admiration for Trimble. I mean, he at least he tried, but um, I thought uh, John Hume would have been the guy that would have been able to pull, pull this together, if anybody could. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, it, it's the same sad old story. He got you know pushed out of the way, um, and, and the, the extremists have, have taken over the political spectrum. Um, on my side, is there any? I, Do you admire? Do you have some some heroes on the uh, on the Protestant side? Uh, you mentioned David Trimble, who was was. He and uh, Hume shared the, the yeah, Nobel Peace they, Prize. They won the Nobel Peace Prize together. Yeah, I mean, I have some admiration uh, um, for, for Trimble. Um, 
I can't really think of anybody. I mean, I always think of them as just so extreme and, and, and so hardcore in their beliefs that it's very hard um, for them to deviate from that. And, and, and they just think about one thing. I wonder what your thought would be about this. David Trimble's problems in dealing Protestants in leading them is not unlike the problem of an American moderate Republican today in the respect that he's got, that both of them would have had an extreme wing that would have been nipping at their heels and criticizing them for not being more, you know, black and white in their position. And so the American Republicans today, moderates, are, are quiet. And poor David Trimble went through this problem where wherever he tried to, to do something that appeared to be moderate, they'd call him a traitor. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he was swinging back and forth. And it's like having Rush Limbaugh on your heels, you know, on Northern yeah, Irish and politics. Yeah, and anything, they were, the DUP was right there to, to point it out to the people, you see? I mean, he's getting all these concessions, you know, you know, it won't be far before it's, you know, United Ireland. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, those, both those guys really tried. And, um, I mean, they, they were the ones that, that brought it together, you know. Um, and I think uh, the extremists got scared and they, and they played into people's fears. Um, you know, uh, and Sinn Féin did the same thing, the, the SDLP. I mean, you know. Okay. They said they're, you know. You know, John Hume really brought Sinn Féin in from the cold. You know, he set up secret meetings with Jerry Adams and said, in effect, you know, we, you can come into the political process. We'll make it possible for you. In a sense, what Hume did was undermine his own political party because Sinn Féin began pushing and now has become much more popular than John Hume's old SDLP party. So. Yeah. Hume is now suffering from Alzheimer's. His party is clutching onto one seat mm -hmm. in, in Westminster and may well lose that one uh, in this election. So here you have a lesson for moderates. Uh, don't play the game of being a moderate, you know, because you're going to be overcome by, by extremists within your own group. Mm -hmm. And so let's play the same thing with Adams and McGinnis, Jerry Adams and Martin McGinnis. What's your take on them? Uh, very smart, um, politically very savvy. Um, you know, I remember watching interviews with uh, McGinnis and, and Adams on, on Charlie Rose. I mean, I mean, they are two characters, and they, and I mean, you can't help but admire what they have done. Mm -hmm. um, and if uh, you know, they've stuck to their game plan. Um, they had an agenda, and even when they were interned and, uh, and imprisoned, um, you know, why, you know, the loyalists were making little, you know, wallets and ice trays and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. there's Adams and McGinnis studying on mm -hmm. Irish history mm -hmm. and taking the degrees and, mm -hmm. and really honing their political skills, and it shows. I mean, um, I don't like how they got there, you know. I don't like, uh, um, you know, what they what they um, were involved in. I mean, there's Adams. Uh, this is another thing that's going to cause a, you know, a big rift. He's been implicated in that um, murder and disappearance of uh, Mary uh, Jean Mc Jean McConville. 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 We talked about this. The woman who br who cradled the British soldier who was dying in front of her house and then the IRA thought she was an informer? Yeah, and, and apparently they, they, they had found a radio transmitter and uh, this is, you know, this, how the story goes or supposedly goes. And she was warned and um, they supposedly she continued doing it. and. Um, and one of the commanders, the IRA commanders, who just passed away, who, you know. Uh, D Brendan was, Hughes. Brendan yeah. Hughes. They had just written a book, and he yeah. implicated Jerry Adams in it, yeah. and supposedly he went to Adams, and Adams says, well, you got to make her disappear. 
he's gonna go. And uh, now one of the daughters might be bringing a civil suit against Adams. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you, this is this is what you know. This so-called calm um, is a calm before the storm, because okay, the arms might be put away somewhat, but you have all this stuff that's going to surface. Now there's McGinnis saying to Robinson, "Explain yourself. What what's with this land deal thing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, this is the deputy first minister mm -hmm. telling the first minister. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, they don't trust each other." They really don't. You can't become a political leader in Northern Ireland and, and not have blood on your hands. No. I mean, Peter Robinson, there are pictures of him wearing berets and talking about getting rifles, and, and Paisley uh, apparently made it possible for people to get guns on the Protestant side. And obviously, Adams and McGinnis have been up to here uh, with the IRA. And so you can't come through on either side without having engaged in violence or given permission for other people to engage violence. Um, let me, we have just a few minutes left. Let me ask you to, to become a prophet. <laughs> um, imagine yourself 10 years from now and imagine that you're talking to this same group of people and you're telling us what the situation now is in Northern Ireland. Tell us whether, tell us which political party is in power. Tell us whether people have a faith in their future. Tell us whether the guns have been put under the floorboards for good, or whether they've come out again, um, whether sectarianism is still around. Tell us all of that 10 years from now. 10 years from now. Well, I think that um, the situation will be pretty much similar to what it is today. I think the DUP will still be there. I think Sinn Féin will still be there. Um, they not only contest seats in the north, but also in the south. Um, I think the moderates will be very marginalized. Um, I still think there'll be paramilitary activity. I still think that there'll be um, hardcore Republicans and hardcore loyalists still around, um, dissatisfied with the situation. Um, I, I, Are you pessimistic about the future? Yes, I am. I'm probably more pessimistic now than I was last year. <laughs> and if the Conservatives get in, uh, in, in this election that come up in May, um, that will be a big blow to nationalists and the Republicans. Um, For the reason that Conservatives will do what? Um, there will be not as many concessions, um, and there will be, like Thatcher, I mean, she had no tolerance for, for, for the for national the cause or, right. or for the Republican cause, and I feel that Cameron will probably be the same kind of um, animal as uh, Thatcher was. Um, you know, like you said, the, the SD, I mean, I mean, the SDLP and the Unionist Party, I mean, they're in deep trouble right now. I can't see how, how they can claw their way back. I mean, like you said, the SDLP is hanging on to one seat. Um, the UUP is a spent party. Um, I know. So the moderate position is spent, you're saying? Yeah, I, I believe that. Um, and he, you know, here, here we go. We're, we're, we're talking about this peace process and, uh, you know, and, and things are being better. But if you look at it, what have you got after 30 odd years? You've got the two extremes right back. It's like full circle. It didn't work then. I don't think it's going to work now. I mean, I, I just. Uh, uh, there'll be some event that will really trigger it off again. Um, it could be, you know, 
perish the thought, but if, if, if a nationalist leader like Jerry Adams were assassinated. And there's been threats against them. Yep. I, mean, I mean, if they pull something like that off, then you'll have the dissonance going, told you so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, that's all they're waiting for. That's all yeah, it would take. Yeah, yeah. it would. Just you know? a, a flash. Yeah. A flash. And, you know, and then it's like, okay, back in the bunker. Okay. Um, Another question from the floor. I just, uh, I wanted to ask um, who, um, when you did come to America, uh, who you brought with you, and also um, what sort of obstacles you ran into both leaving and then coming to America. Good question. Yeah, that is a good. Um, Did you come by yourself? Or? Yeah, I came by myself. I mean, I, you know, I met my first wife when we were having this transatlantic romance. It was costing a fortune. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she'd come over and live in London, and then I'd go over and live in California for a while, and we did that for over a year, and I decided to come here. Um, no, I didn't have m many problems coming into the country. I mean, you know, British and, and America have this relationship and it's, it's, it's pretty easy to um, come here. Uh, and that was back in 91. Um, and I had no reservations about leaving there. I, you know, I'm quite happy I did that. Um, Actually, quite happy I left both places, Northern Ireland, England. Mm, mm. Um, and I did, I took my citizenship in 2001 um, in uh, Vermont. And it was very moving and very nice, and I'm very proud to be part of this country. Um, you know, when I took Bill's class, four or five years ago, whatever it was, you know, I was ready to kill him. I was like, because <laughs> he just, he brought all this, this surf and, this, and it drove me nuts. Why? Why? I don't know. Because it brought it back up again? It or? brought it all back okay. up and then I started thinking about things and, you know, trying to, you know, figure out if, you know, should I have stayed? I mean, and then thinking, no, that would have been crazy. Why would I have done that? I probably would have been prison or something, you know, or even worse, who knows, but, um, no, trying to just, a lot of people from the north really get mad, especially when they're away and living somewhere else, mm. with people from mm. Northern Ireland, mm. <laughs> they drive them nuts, <laughs> because it's like, they, they have this, you know, this, ideal or view that they bring with them and it's something that you've left behind and you want to tell them shut up I'm, I'm not even interested I don't care you know I don't care what's going on but you are interested though but I am I know and that's the thing it's like I keep getting dragged in you talk it. to him on the telephone he knows everything that's going on he knew he knows what happened yesterday and what happened last week so know, you've I, departed in one way, but you're still... I still get drawn into it, and it's like, you know, something will just come across, you know, my path, you know, reading the newspaper, or, you know, on the internet or whatever, and then I'm brought back into it, and, and I want to I wanna know. And then if I get a call from over there, they're always surprised, because I, I know. <laughs> well, did you hear this? Yes, I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. I knew all about it. Do you but, find your accent returning? When you talk yeah, on the telephone? Yeah, it does, yeah. But, you know, it was funny, I was over, my s sister lives in Germany, and it was, uh, we're all kind of scattered all over the place now, because we all, we're lucky enough to get out. And uh, I was over there, and my older brother was there, he li still lives in London, and then I had my cousin, you know, the staunch loyalist, that hope he never sees this. <laughs> <laughs> sends me all the, you know, loyalist <laughs> stuff over. And he was over, and we're in my sister's kitchen having a few beers and that. By the way, the Germans make the best beer in the world. <laughs> and uh, we're having a drink there, and I go out, and I'm going to the restroom and that. And I come back, and they're all laughing. It was so funny. He says, oh, when you left, Julie says, boy, doesn't he talk slow. 
<laughs> I was like, all right, send me some beer, silver. <laughs> Try and get up to speed. That, that's a really interesting point because especially in Protestant working class people, words, sentences become a constant sound and you have to, there, there aren't separate words, they're just all run together, right? Yeah. And so you do, you speak slow compared I to... I do. And uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny, it's like... Speak more like you John know, Wayne, you know? I mean, like a Newton Abbey, you know, I mean, that's only seven miles outside Belfast. There's like 10 different dialects. I mean, people from the Shankill talk a million miles an hour. It's real, you know, and you don't want to say, what, what? You'll be like, what's mm -hmm, wrong with him? Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. But you just nod your head a lot. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, always, always gets you off. Well, let's end on this point. You know, if you haven't caught on already, this class is about learning what it's like on the ground. And Chris tonight gave us, I think, in some ways a surprise view of what it's like on the ground for someone born and brought up in, in a hardcore Protestant neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. several of them actually. And uh, I want to suggest that we give Chris a round of applause for this. <laughs> Thank you for coming here tonight. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Get my sponsor in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good session. Good session.